with the title given India Ideas Summit and also looking at maximizing the next 75 years of India-US prosperity. So it doesn't give you any chance to think of anything else. The title is so well worded. It makes it possible for all of us to sit up and say what exactly can be the contributions each one of us can make. So thank you very much, USIBC, US Chamber of Commerce, for coming together at a time when the world is going through turbulent changes. And these are not such changes that it affects only some countries and the others are safe. No country is safe or no country, uh, country is so immune that they're not going to be affected by these changes which are happening much beyond, I suppose, all our control. So it is a time when all of us will have to really work hard to see what are the best ways in which we can synergize our uh, linkages and come out because the kind of potential that exists in maximizing the prosperity by collaborating between the two countries, we stand to benefit not just as two countries, but the contribution that together that we can make will have an impact on the globe, which in some parts are still struggling to have basic securities, whether be of food or be of energy. So thank you very much again for having this gathering at a time when all of us will have to definitely do the critical thinking so that we can help not just ourselves, but the people around us. I think the current status of the US-India relationship is something worth recalling for just a minute, even if it's a repetition of very many things that have been said earlier. Um, in the last eight years for sure, where I've been party to the decisions and also to the various engagements, I've seen there's been, I've seen that there's been a very uh, interactive relationship between the US and India. And that interaction again has been very pointed. It's just not uh, sharing some thoughts and some homilies here and there, but very pointed and understanding each other's compulsions, challenges, as much as understanding the potential that exists. And being responsive, therefore, we have also helped in getting over several such hurdles which have otherwise held back investments coming into India. And on that, I will emphasize that Prime Minister himself engages with businesses directly, gets his ideas, and also makes sure the engagement with ministers, engagement with India's business interests are, are all simultaneously held, that when the actual decision making happens, the input at various levels are obtained, and therefore responsive decisions are taken. Um, it might be uh, overdue when I say that the inputs, particularly as an example, particularly on the insurance sector, which has been given since Prime Minister took over as uh, the head of the government in uh, government of India. It took a couple of years, but the government squarely and roundly responded to all the requests made to open up the insurance sector where India has immense potential. That is one classic example where engagements, exchange of ideas, and also being at the level of the Prime Minister itself, these exchanges have transpired into policy initiatives. Now, that is the kind of engagement which we need to rapidly uh, ramp up for the next couple of months so that truly for the next 75 years, maximizing the potential that exists, we can lay the foundation. The foundation exists, we'll have to further strengthen it. And I think uh, mutual understanding, particularly at a time when the world's so divided, and the world is so engaged in such activities which you think 
who exactly would want this to happen. But it, when it is happening, none of us feel empowered enough to stop it. So we are at very severe challenging times. And therefore, I would think such engagement at this level will only further strengthen common shared values between India and the US. And the shared values doesn't just stop with democracy. It also helps in freeing economies, which are otherwise very throttled by engagements which are not so desirable. So I would think um, shared values should now enlarge itself to values of common beliefs, such as your economy, the free economy, liberal values, liberal but respecting countries and their sovereignties, liberal as yet the individual country's civilizational values. And therefore, I think the word that Atul Keshap mentioned during his introductory remark, that if there is mutual respect, it, sh it takes us quite a distance in this engagement. The outstanding three or four issues, outstanding I say, not just because it's been pending, but which are eternal values and eternal relevance to our economies, is first of all, as I said, economy itself and the democratic values, the freedom, individual freedom that, you, that we hold uh, very precious to ourselves. But the commonness also expands into concerns that we have. We are very concerned, we meaning not just India, but you as well, if I understand, are very concerned about how we are going to get over the uncertainties which are before us. The uncertainties, I start with something which is not really on a list of priorities, top on the list, but I start with the complexity which is there in handling climate-related issues. Every one of us, because we periodically attend these climate conferences, have committed ourselves to nationally determined uh, commitments, whether in transitioning, whether engaging a lot more in uh, renewables, and so on. But even as we are plotting our course, came huge big uncertainties in terms of the availability of the crude, availability of natural gas, and also the uncertainty because of the war. No. It, it, it doesn't surprise, but indeed it should surprise each one of us that we have not even thought about such extreme exigencies, that many of us are now, without blinking an eyelid, saying that, sorry, we'll have to go back to coal at least for some time. And there is no other way. And I also admit that there's no other way. Many of us have openly said, we want to go back to coal because it's becoming expensive. That argument for India, for instance, holds a big weight because even we feel affordable energy for our huge population where our developmental uh, milestones are slightly differently placed within the country. There are some parts of the country which are fairly well developed. There are other parts which are not so developed. But for all of them, we are here to provide affordable energy. And at a time when we were looking at moving out of coal, and I remember in two of my budgets, placing emphasis that we shall move out of thermal, we shall close some of the legacy thermal power producing uh, whatever companies, and then get on to greater emphasis on a transitional energy, which is natural gas, and then equally ramp up our renewable investments and production. Now, this has received a big jolt. And therefore, now we are also saying we need to fall back on coal for some more time. And it worries me about how these coal dependency again will have to be cut down and we can get back to the platform of transitioning into uh, less environmentally threatening source. So this jolt, which is not just for India, which is for everybody, but for India, it becomes even more onerous because of the size of our country and the different levels of development. So on climate, I think, between India and US, with this concern, and also with the development, there is so much happening, threatening 
energy security of the world. It is for us to see how best we can come up with solutions, even in the transition period, till before the world comes back to the normalcy. But I find three strengths um, which are typical for India, which can now become the platforms based on which we can maximize on the prosperity in the next 75 years between India and the US. And the three strengths that I want to talk about are the size of Indian economy, which about which uh, you had uh, 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 the speaker before me, uh, Mr. Brilliant, talk about the size of the Indian economy today, fifth, sooner, third, and also the diversity of the Indian economy offers a great lot of opportunity for the next 75 years. Second, India's demographic strength, a demography which I like to upfront say is not the demography of 50 years ago, of 100 years ago, of 200 years ago. A demography which was only labor, manual labor, labor which were during the imperial labor era shifted mercilessly into plantations far away from home. They were also not the early 60s migrants who were labor who went seeking jobs elsewhere because they couldn't have the job here. Today it is not that labor which is uh, the demographic strength. The demographic strength of India is twofold if I look at it. One, they are skilled, high-end, technically savvy people who are giving solutions to the world for digitizing their economies. They are the people who are giving solutions to the world on very many health-related issues. They are doctors, pharmacists, scientists. They are, the, they are the people who are launching rockets. They are the people who today before you are coming up with solutions for a futuristic world. So it's not labor which is the demographic strength of India. It is the skilled manpower which is also very adept at moving from one level of technology to another without causing major disruptions to the existing framework wherever they are engaged in. Equally, the same demography is the one which has the purchasing power in its hand. It is largely middle class, but very aspirational. And that money is the one which is going to buy products made outside, products made within India, and that market is a captive market for any investor. We are not asking for investments to boost our economy and therefore, you know, as a, as a largies. It is more an investment where you have an existing cap, uh, captive market and beyond which you can also look at an export elsewhere. But that captive market gives you equally the supply of labor, which is absolutely skilled, not blue collar, but not even the white collar. As they said in Davos a couple of years ago, the new caller, which is technology savvy. That's a second. And the third is the prowess that India has acquired in the last few years in the digital world that has influenced the way in which we have spread vaccination, certified vaccination, also give a platform for the global uh, communities on how to track, trace pandemics, also how to track and trace, uh, trace patients. And we have also made sure that such a platform is not our property. We have opened it up for the entire world. I didn't have to say much more uh, on the India stack, which is making a very big buzz around financial uh, domains, the payment systems, and now I've heard several countries talking to us if the India stack can become a global stack in that we have payment structures, financial technologies, which can talk to each other between countries, India and Singapore, India and UAE are at an advanced stage in talking about um, interoperable systems in the financial, which is going to ease out a lot of cross-border payments.